Hello guys and welcome to another calculus video. In this video we are going to be talking about a very interesting branch of math which is called the calculus of finite differences and we're just going to be doing a sort of introduction here and um, I'm not I'm going to not be thoroughly teaching these topics so I won't have any practice problems which is sort of introduction to uh, a relatively easy branch of math I would say at least on the base level once you learn calculus uh, this branch of math should be not too difficult to gain a basis in at least to help you solve some problems so let's go ahead and jump right into it so what exactly is the calculus of finite differences so it's the analog of calculus which is concerned with functions that are defined discreetly rather than continuously so what this means is in normal calculus we're talking about functions that map an input in the reals to an output in the reals while functions in the calculus of finite differences map inputs in the integers to outputs in the integers. And actually, I should change that because very often we will have um, functions which will map inputs in the integer to outputs in R. So I'm going to go ahead and fix that right there. I didn't think about that too much. But um, essentially all the inputs are going to be integers rather than real numbers. So that means the derivative and the integral are no longer going to be useful operators because after all how are you going to take the derivative of a function the, the slope of a function when really it only takes on values at very uh, discrete um, points which are far away from each other I mean it's no longer quite so useful because we can't we can no longer take the limit as h goes to zero of something because uh, our function isn't going to be defined in that space in between the integers. So instead, we use the difference operator, which is represented by a delta, and the anti-difference or summation operator. So uh, the summation operator is the equivalent of the integral, and the difference operator is the equivalent of the derivative. And we have difference equa equations, which, which replace differential equations, and the z-transform, which is not exactly an analog, but it is sort of similar to the Mellon and Laplace transforms, more so the, the Laplace transform since we use the Z transform to solve difference equations. I'll make another video on the Z transform if you guys are interested in that. So what are the applications of this field? And really it's a diverse set of applications because if you think about it, normal calculus shows up all over the place in every sort of branch of science and math. And so this really replaces calculus in any real life situation which is best represented discreetly rather than continuously, such as certain signals and signal processing. You can also use it to derive a ton of different generalized formulas, which you could use in statistics or in competition math, actually. So personally, the way I use it is I use it a lot in Olympiad mathematics, um, which you know is something that I do. Uh, recently, I just took the AMC 12 this year, and I think I used it on four different problems, which is out of 25. So it's absolutely an invaluable tool. Um, you know in so many different ways because that's a whole lot of problems that you can apply this to um, obviously there's other methods to solve all these sort of things but I just think that this is a really straightforward way to think about certain problems so you can also use it to derive lots of formulas so I don't memorize a lot of formulas and this is a really useful way to derive some of them and you can also use them to solve difference equations or recurrence relations so what is the difference operator it's the discrete equivalent of the derivative operator. So here we have the definition of the derivative. The derivative of f of x is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Now notice that delta f of n, which is the same as delta f of n over delta n, is the same as f of n plus 1 minus f of n. Sorry for x, n, and h looking very similar, um, but we won't be dealing with h. So notice that this is actually the same thing as just setting h equal to 1. So instead of letting the limit as h goes to 0. And of course, we can't let h go to 0 because, again, our function is only defined you know, at 1 and then at 2 and then at 3. So we can't let h go to a small number. We have to have the distance between the two points that we're comparing be an integer. And the smallest distance that we can pick for that is 1. And so that's why we use the difference operator with h being 1. So here are very con uh, the, the great thing about the difference operator actually is that to calculate the difference of a function, it's so much easier than than calculating the derivative because you don't need to do a limit. You just, I mean, I mean, you could define it as a limit, but it would be a very easy limit to solve since we don't ever have a zero over zero situation. So, for example, delta of one is just zero, delta of n is just one, delta of n squared is two n plus one, delta of c to the n is c minus one times c to the n delta of natural log of n is natural log of 1 plus 1 over n, 
and delta of ln n factorial equals ln n plus 1. So most differences are easily, yeah, okay. Uh, the similarities and differences from taking the derivative. So um, taking the difference of a power function, so for example, n squared, n cubed, results in a poly polynomial rather than another power function, which is a little bit interesting. For example, if we took the derivative of, n, of x squared, we would get 2x, but the difference of n squared is 2n plus 1. And taking the difference of an exponential function results in the fa same function, but multiplied by the base minus 1, as you can see right here. Now let's talk about the anti-difference. So it's the equivalent of anti-differentiating or integrating, but in the discrete world. So we have that we can do this indefinitely, so we can write that delta f of n is summed with respect to n, so this respect to n thing is not necessarily um, required, so I usually don't have this little uh, lowercase delta n right here. You can if you wish, but um, you know it's kind of going to be assumed if you have this sum that you could just put the sum on n, and so of course when we take the integral of the derivative we get the original function plus some constant. The same thing is true when we do uh, indefinite uh, Anti -diff an indefinite anti-difference. Um, when we take the uh, anti-difference of the difference of a function, we just get the original function plus some constant. Um, so in this case, the anti-difference of 1 is just n plus some constant, of course. And we can also do this definitely, and this is a little bit different because uh, notice that our, our bounds are actually shifted slightly. So we have the sum from n equals a to b minus 1 of delta f of n equals f of v minus f of a. And notice we need that b minus 1. And the reason for this is actually super easy to prove that the difference of, or that the um, sum of the difference is the difference, is the original function, and that the difference of the sum is the original function, just because of this little nice, it just becomes a telescoping series. And if you go ahead and plug in and just uh, cancel out all the intermediate terms, you will find that you'll end up with f of b minus f of a. So that's really cool. Um, it also, uh, the analogs that you can make between calculus and the calculus of finite differences can also go the other way. So you could actually use this to show that the inverse of the derivative is the integral and the uh, and vice versa, which I think is really cool. So the application of this is that if we can find a function g of n such that delta of g of n is f of n, we can calculate the sum from n equals a to b minus 1 of f of n. And although this sounds kind of obvious based on our last slide, you'll, you'll notice that this is actually really useful in a lot of situations because it can allow us to actually guess our g of n for f of n and then refine our guesses from there on forth. So something important to note is that if f of n is a power function of order k, this has to be an integer for this to work, then delta f of f of n is a polynomial of order k minus 1. So we can use this to calculate the anti-difference of power functions easily. For example, let's say I want to calculate the sum from n equals 1 to k of n squared. Well, what I want to find is I want to find some function f of n such that delta of f of n is n squared. Now, I know that if f of n is a power of order k, delta f of n is a polynomial of order k minus 1. So I know that the, the highest power that I need in my f of n is going to be n cubed. So I'm just going to write this in general as f of n equals a n cubed plus b n squared plus c n plus d. And notice that this d doesn't matter because when we take the difference, this d is just going to go to zero, right? It's just an arbitrary constant. So we're going to start with the fact that delta of n cubed is 3 n squared plus n plus 1. Oh, this should actually say 3 n plus 1. Sorry about that. Let me fix that. And essentially, the reason this is important to us is because um, once we take delta of uh, n cubed, we're going to end up with that n squared, which is what we're looking for, of course. So, for example, uh, in this case we want n squared, not 3n squared, so we're going to divide that by 3. So we have now that delta of 1 third n cubed equals n squared plus n plus 1 third. Now in order to get rid of this n, we're going to use delta of n squared equals 2n plus 1. So, since again we have 2n and we have n right here, we're going to end up subtracting 1 half n squared. So now we have that delta of 1 third n squared minus 1 half n squared equals n squared minus 1 sixth. And finally, we need to get rid of this 1 sixth. So we know that delta of n equals 1. So we just add 1 sixth n and we get delta 1 third n cubed minus 1 half n squared plus 1 sixth n equals n squared. And this tells us that the sum from n equals 0 to k minus 1 of n squared equals 2 sorry about that, it should say 2k cubed minus 3n cubed plus um, k over 6. And again, that just follows directly from what we just proved, which I think is really cool. So this is something that I've done 
in pretty much every math olympiad that I've been in because I cannot for the life of me memorize the formula for the sum of squares or the sum of cubes at all, which is very embarrassing, but you know, it, it is what it is, right? Um, and really, it just means that I get a lot more practice in sort of this derivation technique, which can be used for a lot of different functions, not just n squared, um, which I just think is really cool because if you're ever looking for a formula for summation, you can just go ahead and use these principles and find it out pretty easily. Now let's talk about falling powers. So falling powers are a little bit interesting property of uh, this calculated fi calculus of finite differences. So we define n to the m as a falling power of n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to n minus n plus 1. And it's uh, the notation here, it's different everywhere you'll see it. The, the notation I'm choosing to use is n raised to the m over this little bar. So notice that n raised to the 1 over the little bar is just n. n uh, to the 2 falling power is n times n minus 1, and n to the 0 is obviously just 1. And we can extend this to the negative integers, so n to the negative m is 1 over n plus 1, n plus 2, all the way up to n plus m. And so n to the negative 1 falling power is 1 over n plus 1. And something interesting here is that delta of n to the m falling power is m times n to the m minus 1 falling power, and that's pretty easy to prove. This means that the sum of n to the m falling power is 1 over m plus 1, n to the m plus 1 uh, falling power plus some constant. So you can use this as a shortcut to find anti-differences. Well, let's see. Um, we know that sum from n equals 0 to k minus 1 of n squared is going to be... Um, well, well, we're looking for this same thing again. So we take that n to the second falling power is n squared minus n, and n to the first falling power is just n. So if we add these two together, we get our original n squared. So n to the two falling power plus n to the one falling power is n squared. And this helps us because we can now take the sum, or the anti-difference of n squared, to get the sum of n to the two falling power plus n to the one falling power. And this is just one third n to the third falling power plus one half n to the two falling power. And once you go ahead and calculate that, you get 1 third n cubed minus 1 half n squared plus 1 sixth, which is the indefinite anti-difference of n squared. And our last topic for today is going to be difference equations. So these are, in my opinion, the most useful application of uh, the calculus of finite differences because difference equations pop up in all sorts of different situations. Um, you know, most often it's just going to be a simple recurrence relationship, but, you know, it could be something much more complicated in many situations, and we'll talk more about how to solve these in a future video. And then the discrete analog of differential equations. So some examples here are the most simple, which is delta f of n equals g of n, which means that f of n is just the anti-difference of g of n. Or, in this case, we're going to use a slightly different notation, so rather than f of n, we're going to write a sub n, which essentially just means the same thing. It's just a function of n again. So another type of difference equation might be a n plus 1 equals k a to the n, or a sub n, which is pretty easy to solve, and you'll get that a sub n equals k to the n times a 0. Then a more generalized second order difference equation, a n plus 2 plus b a n plus 1 plus c a n, equals 0. So notice that this is kind of similar to a second order differential equation. And we actually solve it in the same way. We just guess a certain value and we go ahead and check to see if it's true. So the way this works is, um, you know, we guess that a n equals some constant c, uh, I guess we shouldn't use c, some constant k times some number lambda raised to the n power. And when you go ahead and substitute it in, you'll find that lambda can take on two different values, the same way that you would after substituting y equals e to the a x into a second order differential equation. And then what you'll end up getting is that a n equals c1 times lambda plus to the n, plus c2 times lambda minus to the n, where lambda plus minus equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4c over 2, just a simple quadratic equation. And there's so many more types of difference equations, I'm not really including them all here, just because that's going to be too difficult. So, they're very difficult to solve in general, because, you know, obviously we may have some, simil some simple cases like this, but, um, you know, some more di difficult cases might be you know, uh, if we have some, you know, other function of n involved, it might become very, very complicated very quickly. But unlike differential equations, we can always create an exact model 
of our function f of n by hand, even if the formula for a solution is not clear. So I'll show you what I mean by this. Let's look at a very simple differential equation or difference equation right here. Delta f of n equals f of n. And after you reorganize the terms here, writing that def delta f of n equals f of n plus 1 minus f of n, you get that f of n plus 1 equals 2 times f of n. Now the solution to this differential difference equation is very, very simple. And you guys probably should have already guessed it. But let me show you that even if we couldn't guess the solution or solve it by other methods, it's totally possible to create an exact model of the, of the, of the function f of n completely by hand. Let's say we let f of 0 equal a. Well, that just tells us that f of 1 is going to be 2 times f of 0, which is 2a. Or f of 2 equals four, 2 times f of 1, which is 4a. And then f of 3 is 8a, and so on. And eventually we find out that f of n is just f of 0 times 2 to the n. And notice we didn't have to plug in anything. Although this obviously was a very simple difference equation, you could actually do the same thing with literally any difference equation. Just take some initial conditions with some constants a, b, c, whatever you want, and then just go ahead and plug in the difference equation over and over again. And that's the main difference that I see between difference equations and differential equations, is that you can get the exact answer for your function in a difference equation just by plugging numbers in. Although you may not be, be able to derive the general formula, um, you will be able to come up with whatever numbers you need. In the other case, with the differential equation, it's actually completely impossible to do that because of the nature of the infinitesimals involved in differentiation. So here's an application of difference equations right here. This is from the AMC 12A 2023, which I took last week. And I believe I qualified for the next round, which I think is awesome. So here's the first five rows of a triangular array of integers as shown below. Now they tell us the rule for this uh, triangle. It's pretty similar to Pascal's triangle, just a little bit different. Um, and they tell us the rule here. And honestly, you know, I was going to try and figure out, okay, based on the rule, what's going to happen to the numbers in each row? How can I figure out, you know, what the numbers are going to be in each, what, what's the general formula for each a number in each row, and then I'll sum up all of that. And it's asking me, what's the unit digit of the sum of the 2023 numbers in the 2023rd row? And you know what? I was trying to figure out that rule and everything, and I was like, you know what? I think I think I can do it easier way. All I care about is the sum of the numbers, right? So what I did was I said, okay, let's define a function S n, and this is going to be the sum of all the numbers in the row n. And notice that we have the first five values of S n just by looking at this triangle right here. So here's what I did. I said, OK, for n, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I calculated Sn. And again, I just took that by summing up the values in each row. I found that Sn equals 1, 2, 5, 12, 27. Then I couldn't tell the pattern directly from there, which, I mean, honestly, some of you probably could have guessed it since the pattern isn't too difficult. But you know, I figured, OK, I'll just take the difference, and then I can figure out the pattern from there. So I took the difference, and I got that delta Sn equals 1, 3, 5, 15, as n is 1, 2, 3, 4. And again, from here, I probably should have been able to guess uh, Sn, right, from the, or delta Sn right there, but I decided, you know what, just to be extra certain, I'm going to take the delta again. So I got that delta squared Sn equals 2, 4, 8, and from there it was pretty obvious to guess that it would continue on as 16, 32, 64, and so on and so forth. So now I have an expression for delta squared Sn, and I can just go ahead and, and take the anti-difference twice, and I get Sn back. So I took the anti-difference once, and um, I got that delta Sn equals 2n plus some constant k. Then evaluating Sn at n equals 1, I found that k was negative 1. So that tells us that delta Sn is 2n minus 1. Again, taking the anti-difference, I got that, two, uh, that Sn equals 2 to the n minus n plus k. And after solving for k, I got that k equals 0, which means that Sn equals 2 to the n minus n. And again, the answer was asking for the units digit of S2023. So S2023 equals 2 to the 2023 minus 2023. And then using the pattern of the units digit of uh, powers of 2, which actually follows a very nice pattern. It's just 2, 4, 8, 6, 2, 4, 8, 6, over, over and over and over. And then using the units digit of this, I found that S2023 equals 5, or is congruent to 5, mod 10, which is, of course, what the question is asking. So again, maybe it's not the most efficient solution, but using a difference equation just makes everything super, super, super straightforward because, again, all of these steps, I'm sure you guys could have followed, and honestly, you guys probably could have done them just based on what I've shown right here in this quick 
probably 30 minute video. And again, you can apply this to all sorts of different problems across all sorts of different types of math. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, it was a little bit different from some of my recent videos, but I still feel that it was very informative, and I hope you guys learned a lot. Tune in for another video that's coming soon where I will talk about the Z-transform and how it can help you solve different equations. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'll see you next time. Bye!